My name is Jerome Carl, and it's J E R O M E K A R L E. Great. Um, Dr. Carl, can you tell me about uh, what you were doing uh, in the 19, early 1940s and how you happened to become part of the Manhattan Project? Well, I had uh, just uh, finished my work in uh, 1943 for my uh, graduation or my degree. Your PhD. PhD degree. And... Uh, I was looking for something useful to do. There was uh, a young man who joined the faculty of the University of Michigan. And uh, he told me that there was something very interesting going on at the University of Chicago. He couldn't tell me what it was but he suggested that I get in touch with them and uh, go down there and talk to them. That's what I did, and that's how I got connected with the Manhattan Project. And uh, my wife came about uh, three to four months after that when she finished her work for a degree. The man in charge of the uh, research program in the area that uh, we were uh, was Glenn Seaborg. And uh, Glenn was uh, one of two people who uh, discovered plutonium. Now, this was the key factor in uh, what we had to do. And that was to find a way to get the oxygen out of the plutonium oxide because with the oxygen in there it was not useful and with the oxygen out of there it was the key factor in the explosive devices that came out of the uh, Manhattan Project. Now, uh, there were various approaches to this, and uh, I had one specific one. When I got there, they had an apparatus that they thought could be used to get the oxygen out. And uh, this was new to me. And I worked on it for about uh, four or five months unsuccessfully. And slowly, I realized what the problem was. The problem was that the temperature in this particular apparatus was about a little more than, a little less than half the temperature that I needed in order to uh, solve the problem. Ultimately, I did solve the problem. In those days, you don't look up a directory and find out that you can get all kinds of equipment to run a laboratory. In those days, you did everything by yourself. And uh, what I did was that I used a piece of equipment 
that I had to handle. in a variety of ways. This equipment was made to run at room temperature. And so I had to do a lot of it to get it up to the temperature that was needed. And I did that. I made all the necessary connections and what have you and brought it to a point where I could get to a temperature that I thought would work. And this was um, after a period of time that was probably uh, three quarters of a year. I started working on what was successful after about uh, half a year. And uh, I got nowhere. And finally then I uh, fixed up this equipment and tested it on substances that were like plutonium, except that th they didn't explode. And, uh, and so they were <laughs> not interesting, but uh, what I was able to do was to set up a series of tests for my equipment to see that everything was in place and everything seemed to be workable. The day came to try it for real. And uh, the first thing that happened is that everybody but me for most of the facility that I was working in were removed from the facility in case something happened. <laughs> I uh, wasn't uh, particularly uh, concerned because I had made many trials to test whether the uh, instrument that uh, I made uh, would work. And so uh, I just proceeded to do this and uh, lo and behold I made plutonium from plutonium oxide. And that's what they wanted. That's what I did. After that things were settling down because uh, the war was almost over. And uh, what happened to my wife and me was that uh, there was some project of interest uh, to the U.S. Navy that uh, my uh, doctorate professor was asked to do and he asked me to come back to work with him on it and I spent two years on this project and I'm happy to say it also worked out and uh, after those two years the war was over etc and uh, both I and Isabella were offered a job at the Naval Research Laboratory. And that turned out to be one of the most <laughs> marvelous things <laughs> that uh, happened to us. It was a great place to work. And now, almost 60 years later, we're still working there. <laughs> so um, that's uh, the general picture of what role I played in this uh, work at uh, Chicago and uh, 
the nice consequences that came out of it. Glenn Seaborg uh, was a very nice man, and I enjoyed uh, working under his supervision. In the course of years, uh, we stayed in touch. He would come to Washington uh, in later years. There was always concern at the university that what they were doing would get out into the public. And uh, there was a feeling which I shared with them that almost everybody in Chicago knew that there was something going on, but they didn't know what. And uh, they always uh, wanted to be very careful and in one of the uh, one of the aspects of the project that Isabella worked at uh, was the uh, production of certain types of materials that were brought from the place where we worked to uh, the university, which was uh, across a grassy knoll for the purpose of uh, further investigation as to whether what she had synthesized, what she had put together, uh, was actually uh, what it was intended. And there was a professor there uh, who uh, had the right kind of equipment and he would do the work. Well, Isabella was uh, about 22, 23 at the time. She looked very young, and she looked like she was a student there and not somebody working on the Manhattan Project. And um, one day, Somebody, I don't know who it was, saw her walking across the campus to have her latest work tested. And this person became very concerned about the fact that she was carrying this across the campus. So, what they did was have her accompanied by two men who were about twice as tall as she was, standing and walking on both sides of her, protecting her from all those people who would be <laughs> looking for her to be having all these uh, important things going on. Well, it, it was absolutely silly. This was as close as you could get to tell people that there really was something going on at the University of Chicago, whereas she was uh, lost in the view of people when she was by herself. So it uh, was a silly thing, we thought, and we had a laugh about it, but that's the way it was. <laughs> I had this basic piece of equipment that I thought I could use, and what I had to do was to insert into the equipment facilities that could raise the temperature very much and would also rotate 
the equivalent at a very high speed. That allowed me to put in a little capsule the plutonium that I wanted to be removed of uh, oxygen and would be at high enough temperature that the oxygen would essentially leak out. And so it required uh, some electrical connections. It required uh, electrical connections and uh, attachments that allowed high-speed spinning and also the heating up that was required. And uh, it was straightforward. It, it wasn't really difficult to put this together. And uh, it just seemed to work. I had to uh, guess somewhat as to how high I needed to go in the um, temperature. But I made a, a good lucky guess, and it was just about right. In all your years as a scientist after this, after World War II, uh, how would you say things changed? I mean, the research support you had, is it, was it dramatically different after the war? Or was this a big turning point, or did you not uh, operate differently? The way we get funded in the um, Naval Research Laboratory is somewhat different, or perhaps even considerably different, than how it works in universities. In universities, each man, woman, has a project. And uh, they write and write proposals that come through the um, national facilities that uh, fund these things. At the lab, what you have is a group of people working in a certain area, usually. And uh, that entire area gets funded. Certainly, again, on the basis of uh, what you're going to do. But it was particularly easy for us when we first got there because we needed equipment to be made and we had the shops to make it. We had uh, a gentleman who was the head of uh, our unit. There were 
I would say about eight such people as the head of units, about eight units at that time, uh, chemistry, physics, and that sort of thing. And uh, the man who was the head of our unit, head of philosophy, and he said, you hire the best people you can find, you fund them, and you leave them alone. And I can tell you that really worked. <laughs> and we and our other colleagues around who were in that atmosphere did marvelous work. So you didn't uh, spend half your life writing proposals. <laughs> I want to um, maybe go, go to <clears throat> one of the questions that I asked about how you felt about uh, dropping the bomb. That's a very interesting question. The people. in this entire group that I was uh, a part of, had written to the president to please not be the first one to drop the bomb. This was a general feeling everybody sound up. And I spent 50 years of my life being disappointed that we were the first ones to use the bomb. And in 1995, which was 50 years later, I learned what really happened. And I'll tell you the story. What really happened was that before we dropped the first bomb, we asked them to quit. That was it. No more fighting. They wouldn't. And then they were preparing the second bomb. And we asked them to quit, and they didn't. And then the Japanese were again preparing to continue. But after the first two bombs had fallen on them, Hirohito told them to quit. And that's how the war was stopped. Now why did we do this? We had, I think it was, I may be wrong, but I think it was three million men some distance from Japan who were going to invade Japan. And they were all, I can tell you, I know a lot of them, all scared to death. Because when you invade somebody else's territory, in particular, Japan has so many mountains just a bit away from the coast, that they'd be sitting up there, the loss of life would have been horrendous. I didn't know that for the first 50 years. But after I heard that, then I said, it was too bad, but I don't know what else they could do. And they saved everybody's life. 
after it became known amongst people that uh, we had worked in the Manhattan Project. There were many people whom we knew here in the Washington area and uh, in other parts of the country who were part of that force that was going to have to go into Japan. And it was really astonishing the number of thank yous that we got for working on the Manhattan Project. My view so far as uh, making a point of eliminating uh, such weapons because of their tremendous destructive capabilities is as follows. Surely uh, nobody in their right mind would want to have these kinds of explosives around. But you have to stop for a while and think about current circumstances. And current circumstances are that we have gone all the way from World War II to no fighting amongst the big countries that have these great weapons. And I think that there's a very good chance that the fact that they have these weapons has played a role in keeping the powerful countries from fighting with each other. And I think that this aspect of the problem needs to be kept in mind before some arrangement gets made to have all of these uh, types of equipment destroyed. So my feeling is be careful. These weapons may be preventing big wars to come out again. So that's my point.